Rode CC recommends is back and we've got a collection of the biggest and best cycling products that you need to know about. We've got a gravel bike, two wheels, gravel bikes. two gravel bikes, yeah. we've got wheels, clothing, power meters, alongside some top quality buying advice that you need to see before you invest your money. Absolutely. Nice to be back on the sofa yes. with you, Liam. You're not Becca. I'm not Becca. She's very pregnant and we're wishing her all yeah. the best with that. And we might see a baby soon. <gasps> the new baby. Amazing. Be brilliant. Right, Dave, um, I'll start us off with one of the most if not the most expensive gravel bike on the market right now. This is the Specialized S-Work Crux. How much is that going to set you back, Liam? Oh, it's only uh, £11,300, which basically is chump change. Um, jokes aside and price aside too, uh, this is actually a bloody brilliant bike for faster gravel riding or mixing road and off-road sections. I absolutely love testing this and I was uh, very sad to see it go. I bet you were, you little magpie. Yeah, absolutely. Chinese. Now, Specialized has used the same carbon layout methods as with the Athos, which is one of the reasons that those two bikes look so similar. And just like the Athos, you thought that the handling was spot on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's fun on the gravel. It probably favours uh, tighter technical stuff than like Fire Road, but it also absolutely rips through the lanes. It's very light too. Yeah, and I guess that means it's a really good climber. Yes, um, the low weight is brilliant for the climbs and any accelerations, but there is some really good low speed kind of um, stability here that really favors you on technical climbs and makes them really good fun. Excellent. Now, it's worth pointing out that aside from the bottom bracket cage mount, you've not really got specific places for bags. Uh, it's also one of the stiffer gravel bikes in the market, so it doesn't provide the plushest ride out there. If you're interested, I'd look at the comp model. It's just gonna be as much fun. And a fraction of the price. Yes. Right, onto a book about a racer that became a godlike figure in Belgium. God is Dead tells the story of the colorful professional cyclist mm. Frank Vandenbroek. He didn't seem to do anything by half measures. No, so Vandenbroek experienced a rapid rise to fame, but although he did quite well in, in the sport, a combination of drugs and other distractions uh, curtailed his career. So McGrath interviews a lot of people during his research. Some are to be expected, um, such as family members and former teammates. Others less so, such as um, an addiction specialist. Mm, interesting. So it makes for a really good story and McGrath has told it really well. A little bit before your time, Frank Vandenberg? He was, yeah. I didn't really see him race, but I read this book. A few came into the office, a few copies, yeah. and um, really interesting. I learned a lot. Excellent. Next up is the No Pins Pro One All Season Skin Suit, which provides a great fit, a useful number pocket, and is far cheaper than its rivals. This is a brilliant uh, skin suit for cyclocross racing and will cover you well for like early time trials and circuit races. The Lycra is heavier than your typical um, skin suit and you'll find it warm enough for the start of races just to take the chill off. That's good, but one thing you were saying was that you get quite a bit more sweatier in the, uh, in the all season yeah. skin suit than in thinner ones. It's just because of the thickness of the fabric. Seemingly. Yeah, it isn't as breathable. Um, during a race, this isn't too much of an issue, but you're going to want um, a warm top as soon as you finish. Otherwise, you're going to freeze. Fair enough. But basically, great fit, great pad, mm. cheaper than anything else out there. The number pocket is really useful yes. and it's easy to get on. Okay, moving on, you might not be able to afford a new gravel bike or you might be perfectly happy with the one that you've got. But if you're looking for an upgrade for the front of your bike, then the Ritchie Comp VentureMax XL is a fabulously wide, a a fabulously wide, wide ergonomic bar that's brilliantly suited for long days and rough trails and wide luggage. So when it comes to handlebars for fast riding on rough surfaces, some would say that wider is better. And at 615 millimeters at the drops, the Ritchie Comp VentureMax XL is one of the widest drop bars around. And when you say some people... Yeah, I ride like 380 <laughs> mil bars on the road, so going to a gravel bike with even like 420s feels super wide oh, to me. I love a wide bar, me. Mm. So for everyone else other than Liam, the Comp VentureMax XL comes in the one XL size of 52 centimeters, as measured at the hoods. But never mind the width, feel the flare. There's 24 yeah. degrees of flare there. It's a bit too flared for me, I, I think. <laughs> um, actually, Dave, what is the point of a flared bar? 
So the flared bar means that the bars stick out, so on, on rough terrain it's much easier to hold them, you don't have to bend your wrist as much, and also it means that the gears are more easily accessible from the drops. Okay, so, so aero tucks aren't really a thing in gravel? Not really in UK gravel, I mean no. if you're doing like a long a long kind of US ride like the unbound gravel, that kind of thing. Oh, you know, fun. you might want to get down yeah. get down and hunker down, but not for not for not for UK what's around the air. No, no, not at all. Absolutely. Anyway, a benefit of it being this wide is there's a huge 46 centimetres free inside the hoods to carry luggage. So specifically things like dry bags or tents or other things that are wide. And the backward sweep of the bar helps a bit as well. It gives you a smidge more room for your fingers. You will certainly be able to brag at the cafe about having the widest bar. Um, time for a recommended cafe now, Dave. Yep. Um, where are we headed? Well, we're not headed anywhere, unfortunately. We're sat That's on the sofa. Fair. No. I want to go somewhere. But let's go virtually through the magic of film to check out our cafe of the month. This month's cafe is more than just a cafe and it's also the start and finish point of our route of the month later. Hales Fruit Farm near Winchcombe is a fast growing family run enterprise that welcomes outdoor enthusiasts all year round. There's the tea room of course, offering quality coffee, a huge range of homemade cakes, plus hot and cold food to fuel and replenish walkers and cyclists alike. There's plenty of indoor and outdoor seating for large groups and sturdy racks for bikes. If you've worked up a different kind of thirst, Hales brew their own craft cider exclusively from their own orchards, which were originally planted way back in 1880. And if the cider hits the spot a little too well, then there's camping available on site as well. If you pick your day, you'll even be able to finish off your ride with a fresh stone-baked pizza. As per usual, all that's done is made me hungry. Um, to take my mind off it, should we have a look at the Dolan GXT? Let's do exactly that. Now this is a hugely capable gravel bike. Uh, it's got a titanium frame that offers a really good balance of stiffness and comfort and geometry that allows you to feel, you know, properly in control whatever the terrain. It's beautifully made, it comes with all of the mounts you could need and, you know, although it's not cheap, it's pretty good value compared to some of its rivals. <laughs> it's better than the specialised. Uh, specialised, yeah. <laughs> um, even though the GXT is one of the stiffer titanium frames, that underlying tone of vibration cancelling is still there. It's notable when riding on hard packed gravel sections or on the road. You've also got loads of mounts, so the Dolan can be used for some serious load carrying and the tautness of the frame will stop any flex when you're hauling that baggage up a steep hill. Yeah, really good for that. Now, Dolan offers a good level of customization on its builds and our test model, that came with a fork upgrade. So we got the full carbon fiber GXT gravel adventure fork, which has the three bolt mounting points on each side for your, for your adventure cages. Inside the frame, you get pretty wide tyres in there. I mean, we fitted 43mm panoracers. They were really good for the type of riding we did. We could have gone wider from there. Mm. Not only is that titanium frame lovely, this would really be one to look at if you're you know, aiming to create the gravel bike of your dreams. Yeah, I lots think. of customization options. Uh, so next up is the Prime Primavera Shorty Carbon Saddle. It's comfortable straight out of the box, thanks to its flowing shape and perfectly judged padding. For a full carbon saddle, it's very well priced too. Yeah, we've seen a lot of short saddles lately. I mean, over the past couple of years, it's been a real trend and the shape of the Primavera is spot on. It's raised at the back slightly to give you a bit of a platform to push against when you're climbing hard. And then it's got a subtle sort of arch in the middle for a bit of comfort when you're tapping out the miles. And also stops you sliding forwards or backwards because mm. that can be a problem. And then the short nose, that allows you to get down and dirty in the drops, you know, for that really powerful position. Yeah, the padding is thick enough that it takes out high resolution buzz without muting kind of all feeling from the road. And beneath the padding is a 3K carbon fiber shell, which brings its own bit of flex to the ride. The rails are also 3K carbon and are marked with easy to read measurements. I like an easy to read measurement. We love an easy to and read measurement. And it's 120 pounds, which is really a good price for something like yeah, this. Yeah, that does make some saddles feel unnecessarily expensive. We have seen a few of those in yeah. the past, haven't we? Seeing as these short saddles are so popular now. Should we have our buying advice about yep. them? Yeah, let's do that. And here is tech editor Matt to tell you all about them. It's always hard to offer generic advice on saddles because it's probably the bit of the bike that is the most personal. If there's one thing we definitely know about saddles, it's that what's right for one person can be agony for another. So we'd always advise you to try before you buy if you can. 
But if you're in the market for a new saddle, then you'll probably have seen that there's a trend towards short saddles at the moment. So what's it all about and should you get one? Short saddles have been popular in time trials and triathlon for many years. They came about because when you're in an aggressive aero position, the nose of the saddle can put pressure on your soft tissue and lead to problems. Eliminating the nose of the saddle helps to stop that from happening. So there was a time when pro riders or the mechanics would just take a saw, chop the end of the nose off and uh, in order to get it down to the length that they wanted for a time trial. Nowadays you can get a huge range of short saddles off the shelf. They tend to be around 250 millimeters long compared to 275 millimeters or 300 millimeters even for a standard saddle. It's fair to say that short saddles are mostly designed to let you get into an aggressive position. But that's not the only reason you might want to look at getting one. Some people also like short saddles because of their increased clearance for the quads and hamstrings. There's less saddle at the front to get in the way basically. So if you have issues with your legs rubbing the saddle nose, for example, it might be that a short saddle will suit you. A short saddle might also just give you a shape you get on with better for whatever reason. So it's good to have another option if you're struggling with standard saddles. Short saddles are more designed for faster riding and they're definitely aimed at what you might call the serious end of the spectrum. But prices start from around £50 so it's not like they're all super expensive. The things you need to consider are the same as with any other saddle. Priority one is comfort. Does the saddle fit you? Is there enough padding for you? And is it in the right places? Most short saddles are designed with a cutout to relieve pressure. In fact, it's pretty unusual to see one without one. Is it in the right place for you? Does it do the job? Most of these things you're really only gonna find out by trying a saddle, if you possibly can. Lots of independent bike shops offer saddle testing, so you can test out different shapes and see what works for you. After that, it's time to think about build and budget. Many saddles are offered in a range of different builds and as you go up the price range, the saddles get lighter and the materials get more expensive. Nylon bases get replaced with carbon, while steel rails become titanium and then carbon. Normally there isn't a huge difference in the comfort between lower and higher end saddles in a range though. How comfortable you'll be is down to whether the shape and the padding suits you and those things tend to be fairly consistent even as the materials change. Hopefully you've now also learned something about the short nose saddle. Dave, you like them? Not for me. No, I prefer a longer saddle. I, I like the movement you can get up and down it. How about you? Mm. I do actually, but then I have a really low front end on my yes, bike. Yes, you so. do. They're kind of designed for My me. My bad doesn't thank me for that. No. Right, on to next two products, and we've got two sets of carbon wheels to tell you about. Yeah. Firstly, we've got Hunt's 54 Aerodynamics carbon disc wheel set, which employs the aerodynamic thinking behind some of its top end wheels. Um, the result is hugely fast, reasonably light pair of wheels with really good wind cheating effects. And they're also solidly built and they're also well priced, lots alike. Mm. With modern materials and build techniques, Hunt has managed to bring this set of 54 millimeter deep section hoops down to a claimed 1,524 grams, which would be impressive for even a set of wheels at kind of half the yeah. depth. With that in mind, they don't hamper you on the climb and you get that aero boost on the descent. So they can happily sit on your road bike with all the advantages and none of the trade-offs. Pretty good. They have a 29 millimeter external width, which Hunt says has been optimized for 25 to 28 mil tires, race tires really, but they'll happily work with much bigger tires. You can go up to about mm. a 50 mil. Um, stiffness is really good too. Hard efforts out of the saddle didn't produce any lateral flex to worry about. So it's good in that regard. That price for me, it's the real selling point. Um, it's still a lot of money, I admit that, but they're far better than some other fancy carbon offerings out there. Yep, and another brand that scores well on value always is Scribe, and these are their Elan Wide Plus 42D carbon spoke wheels, easy to me to say. <laughs> these are sub 1400 gram all-rounders that bring a bit of aero assistance to a good balance of stiffness and lack of weight. These scribes are a little bit shallower than the hump wheels that we've just talked about. So if you do favor heading up into the hills, then they might be a better bet. Both, however, are tubeless ready and we had no issues setting up a range of tires with and without inner tubes. 
back to the scribes in particular and these have an external width of 30 millimeters and a 21 millimeter internal width meaning that they suit road tires from 25 to 32 millimeters and they could be used for lighter gravel duties yeah, i'd say probably connecting the rims to the hubs are some fancy carbon spokes and inside the hubs you'll find scribes uh, own ratchet drive yeah so the ratchet drive gets instant engagement which gives no slack whatsoever really good pickup and if you like a subtle sound to your freewheeling then uh, you might be out of luck here it's a bit on the buzzy side what's your feeling on that uh, i'm silence is golden me oh, are you just... i like a bit of buzz there i like to apply grease liberally nice personally uh, let us know down in the comments um, are you all about the buzz or is silence golden for you okay before we get to our final products it's just time to tell you about a lovely route you can go out and ride for this month's recommended route we're off on a tour of the Cotswolds we've started at Hales Fruit Farm that we featured earlier as our cafe of the month though of course you can hop on a loop anywhere you like Burton on the Water, Lower Slaughter and North Leach all lie on the route and Stow on the Wold and Winchcombe are just off it. Cheltenham is the biggest nearby town. This is a fairly lumpy route, but you get a gentle start with a descent past Hales Abbey over the old Cheltenham Broadway railway line where you might spot the steam train that runs as a tourist attraction. You'll pass close to Broadway Tower through well-kept hamlets and villages. And there's lots of open spaces and big views to Burton on the Water and North Leach, both home to plenty of cafes for refueling. You'll need the energy for the up and down section heading north past Winchcombe before we can relax for the final descent back to Hales. We've got two products left before we award our product of the month. Now, with good waterproofing and windproofing, the Chapeau City Jacket is ideal for fending off the elements, whether you're commuting by bike, walking around town, or even bike packing. Yeah. Being light and very packable, this is a brilliant jacket to have when space is at a premium. Um, if your riding is at a more leisurely pace, as the jacket is designed for, then the low breathability won't actually be an issue. Yeah, having a packable jacket is something that we'd always recommend. Mm. Um, and it really is worthwhile to have one when the weather is changeable. So the Chapeau jacket features quite a slim fit, but it's it's a generous sizing and it's big enough that you can wear your favourite non-cycling specific jumper underneath. What's your favourite non-cycling specific jumper? Oh, now you put me on the spot. Um, maybe a Vail Raven one? Fjell Raven. Fjell Raven. <laughs> Uh, one good detail is it's got a loop so you can hang it up like a normal jacket when you get home. We've seen plenty of jackets that don't have that. It's very frustrating. Uh, it is. Um, there is loads of length in the body and arms and in a large it sizes up perfectly. It's a proper UK fit, that is, it's not an undersized Italian one. Good for the likes of me. Now, nearly taking our award for recommended product was the Wahoo Kicker Core Smart Trainer. Now, a penny under 700 pounds, it's the cheapest direct drive offering in the Wahoo range, and it sacrifices very little in terms of functionality compared with its thousand pound plus competitors. The core can simulate gradients up to 16% and generate up to 1800 watts of resistance. Yes, that's less than the V5, which is the one up, uh, but there aren't many riders who will be troubling these kind of numbers. So it's more than sufficient, really. Yeah, isn't it's more it? than sufficient for me. And me, yeah. <laughs> Wahoo claims that the core has a power recording accuracy of plus minus 2%, which is actually competitive at this price point. Once calibrated, the core tracked an ever reliable quark power meter within a few watts for a fortnight at a time with calibration only required when the trainer was actually moved so it wasn't actually much of a hardship no very good now on rolling zwift and rgt and ruby courses the core is really quick to react to changes so it gives you a good lifelike ride and when it comes down to that all important sprint at the end nice wide base which makes it nice and secure and rigid so put simply the core is quiet accurate and reliable as well as being easy to set up and connect. It's missing extremely little of the functionality of the £1,000 trainers and it outperforms turbos of a similar price. Yeah. And finally, a drum roll because it's time for our product of the month, Liam. It's the 4i Precision 3. So this is a power meter that you reviewed. It is. Why yeah. is it so good? Well, it's reliable, it connects quickly. It's got a longer battery life than the previous model. That's up to 800 hours, which I haven't tested because that would take 800, 800 hours. hours. Yeah. Um, it also gave me consistent data, and all of that makes it really easy to train with on a daily basis. Yeah, and for UK users, this is also the fastest way to get your existing crank converted to a power meter. Yeah, so uh, the price that we've reviewed it as is uh, Shimano's 105 
R7000 crank. If you already have a compatible crank, 4i will install the P3 for just under 300 quid, and they reckon that you can send the crank in on a Monday and have it back for your weekend ride. That isn't bad. That isn't bad. And back to the actual power measurement, the important yeah. bit, everything all good there? Well, yeah, um, the data was just disappointingly normal for me. There was no like 20 watt increase in my FTP, which is So you weren't so bossing annoying. it in your Swift braces then? No, I still can't hang on with the A pluses. I can't hang on with the Bs, mate. So I, you know. I get <laughs> handed to by the Bs as well. Yeah, I tell you when a power meter was useful. And in fact, a 20 watt increase on my FTP would have been lovely when I was doing my Everesting. It would, you'd be struggling at the end there. Oh, you? Just I, a was, bit. I was crawling you could have done with that an extra 20 watts. If you want to see Liam's Everesting challenge, there is a link to that video popping up now. And if you haven't seen any more of these recommended videos, then check out last month's, which has got loads of extra good stuff in it. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel because that really helps us out. And hit the thumb button if you've enjoyed it. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye.